Every year in the Midwest, cicadas get out of their holes, crawl to the top of trees, and scream their minds out for a, about a week or two each. Now really the time varies because this attracts every predator in the area. And the time varies because doing so is energetically expensive and may result in the death of the cicada. So why has such a, a trait been selected for? Well, it's not natural selection, but it is definitely sexual selection. So let's get into the weird and wacky world of sexual selection in this lecture. I'd like you to be able to define linkage disequilibrium. That's kind of a review. <clears throat> Haplotype, linkage equilibrium, and recombination. Again, review. Relate sex to linkage equilibrium. Compare natural and sexual selection. Relate mating systems to the relative costs of sperm and eggs. Compare intersexual and intrasexual selection. We'll do more of them next, the latter on the next lecture and describe different types of male-to-male -male competition. So let's get started with some linkage disequilibrium review. Linkage disequilibrium is when you have genes that are linked, and thus certain alleles get inherited together more often than not. If you're calculating these uh, two different alleles, you're looking at, two, at four different allele combinations. And what we're expecting in a, in a linkage equilibrium scenario is that the four different combinations are all inherited at roughly the same rate independently of one another under the assumptions of independent assortment. And we're looking at these combinations of two alleles, calling that a haplotype. <coughs> because we're looking at only two alleles as opposed to the whole genotype, which for a, for a diploid organism is um, well, four alleles for two genes. When a population can be determined, you can determine the haplotypes by simply multiplying the frequencies of the alleles, that's equilibrium. You can determine the frequency of the haplotype by multiplying the frequency of the alleles. If you cannot, then the two might be in linkage disequilibrium. So we're looking at the frequency of B, uppercase B, given lowercase a, is going to be the same as the frequency of uppercase B, given uppercase a. So uppercase a and lowercase a should be independent of the frequency of B. If the genes are going to be on similar loci on the same chromosome, then you're going to have two alleles traveling together more often than not, and that's what leads to disequilibrium. Another thing that can lead to disequilibrium is if they're being selected for together. <clears throat> so the conditions of equilibrium, the frequency <coughs> of, as I said, uppercase B given uppercase A is equal to the frequency of uppercase B given lowercase a, that B and A are traveling independently. The frequency of any haplotype can be calculated by multiplying the allele frequencies for the haplotype, and that something known as D, which is a disequilibrium constant, is equal to zero. The disequilibrium constant is equal to the frequency of the two dominant alleles times the frequency of the two recessive alleles being inherited together, so those two haplotypes being multiplied, minus the frequency of the heterozygote haplotypes. Simple enough. It sounds simpler enough once we've done every definition and just go blast through it because well, hopefully it sounds simpler enough. All right, so what's the, what are the causes of linkage disequilibrium? Well, genetic drift can fix or eliminate certain haplotypes. So perhaps the uppercase A, lowercase b haplotype simply doesn't exist in the population because these two alleles don't travel together due to random chance. Combining two gene pools that are each at linkage equilibrium may end in linkage disequilibrium because they have different levels of different genotypes, uh, haplotypes. <coughs> or you can have selection of multi-locus genotypes. So it could be that an uppercase A and a lowercase b are actually very beneficial together, but an uppercase A and a lowercase b are deleterious. Or that lowercase a, lowercase b, if inherited together, end up being lethal which is pretty common when two deleterious alleles can be lethal when inherited together. So that's a quick blast through linkage disequilibrium. If you have questions, please refer to the previous lecture. And if that's still not clear, refer to the book. And if that's still not clear, feel free to ask me a question. And if that's still not clear, oh, let me know. You know, let me know if it's still really not working for you. And if we can't work it out, well, we'll figure something out. Don't worry. This is not the core component of the class. It's just a really good thing to learn because going into sex, you need to know why that matters, because sexual reproduction eliminates linkage disequilibrium. Recombination is when you're going to have um, a chiasma form between two alleles 
on a chromosome that are very close loci. And when that chiasmata forms, you break them apart and you're going to swap them with other alleles, which can mean that you're getting new combinations of haplotypes, which is going to eliminate linkage disequilibrium. <clears throat> there is, of course, a higher rate of recombination when genes are more are farther away. And the distance that genes are far are away from each other is measured in centimorgans. Remember, a centimorgan is how often out of 100 a um, break will occur between two different loci and cause recombination. I'd also like you to consider that selection on multilocus genotypes may actually be across two chromosomes. When I say that, um, the recessive alleles, if inherited together, can be, can be lethal. That doesn't require that they're on the same chromosome. They can be two recessive alleles located on two very different places. And that itself can be a problem because linkage disequilibrium can exist across different chromosomes. And we're going to need to know that when we talk about runaway sexual selection in the next lecture. All right, back to sex. Cool. Sexual selection is when we are going to have organisms have different, uh, different not, not different survival and reproduction, but different Re different mating and reproduction. And mating and reproduction, okay, those are the same thing. No, they're not. Mating and reproduction are not the same thing. So what is the importance of sex? Well, genetic variation increases when you're changing allele frequencies and allele um, combinations through recombination. When you have random fertilization, when you have independent assortment, this is all going to increase genetic variation. Go back and check your meiosis from Bio 141. Social ties is, are also important, and social ties are often reinforced by hormones given off during sex, like oxytocin. And this may increase the, off, the offspring's ability to survive, uh, given, uh, given the parents are actually caring for it and giving certain social ties. So why have different sex sets? Well, we're defining here the male as the sperm donor and the female as the egg donor. Why not have three sexes? Just think it through. So which one mates with which one? Why not have four sexes? Think it through. So when we're defining things here, I'm defining male simply as sperm donor and female as egg donor. Gender is going to be something for other courses. And it is important to recognize this kind of sex versus gender thing because we are going to be dealing with hermaphrodites, in which case one of them is going to be donating sperm, in which case it is the male, even though it does have male and female genitalia, and even though it has male and female hormones, and even though it is perfectly capable of making eggs, it is going to be acting in that mating instance as a male. So that's why it's important here to just to define male as what's giving sperm and female as what's giving eggs. I know that there's a lot of subtlety with gender. Take a gender identity studies course. So if there were more than two sexes, think about the difficulty of finding the right mate. If rocks made, made with scissors and scissors made with paper and paper made with Spock, and Spock mated with rocks, then it becomes very difficult to find the correct mate for that scenario. I threw Spock in there, deal with it. All right, however, sexual selection can come up against natural selection. So we're going to be looking at a few extremes here. <clears throat> we call these extremes because this is what happens when sexual selection gets a bit of the upper hand or can go into a space where it's very much selected against. This is what a quote often attributed to Darwin is, every time I see a peacock's tail, I get sick. Because he could not understand why the peacock's tail would ever be selected for using natural selection. So here's a stalk-eyed fly. What happens is flies are going to, um, at a certain stage of their life, they are finished molting, and at, at, sorry, as they're molting, they're going to pump their air, body full of air and push their eyes apart. It's something they can do while their, while their chitin is still not fully solidified. And the stronger a fly is, the more it can push its eyes apart. So the distance between the two eyes is a, is a direct measure of strength. So females are going to prefer males that have eyes that are farther apart from one another. And males will fight with each other. And in order to do so, they'll line up really right in front of each other. And they'll see who's got the longer stalks to see who's got a better sized stalk. And if they're roughly equal, then they will start fighting with each other. So that's a thing. Uh, here's the sarcastic fringe head. There are two of them in this picture, and they're fighting with each other. I have included in the links at the, on the PowerPoint a link to a video that shows them fighting. What happens is they'll fight for territory. And the male-to-male -male fighting has caused selection for the size of their mouths, such that they'll measure each other up for who's got the bigger mouth, and if there is a close match, they'll end up fighting each other. So 
It looks ridiculous because it is, but it helps the males maintain their territory and thus get more mates. And here we have the ruffed grouse of North America. These sacks on the front of it are actually going to be uh, real um, liabilities come the cold season when they need to uh, stay warm and the feathers are what keeps them warm. The large tail and pinion feathers make them easy for predators to capture like coyotes or wolves. Parasites can more easily infest these birds when they're going to have these skin, the skin flaps kind of exposed and they sit around making large booming noises which attracts every predator in the neighborhood. All of these things are liabilities for natural selection, but the females just find them oh so sexy. And here we have, oh, I think it's a tarragon, tarragon, I can't remember the name of this thing, but you see how much skin it's exposing and how it has to make it bright blue and red to attract mates. Now this actually requires it to poof its, um, poof its flap out, and of course you can think of the parasites it'll get, the amount of heat it would lose, etc, etc, but most importantly at all, it is blindingly easy for a predator to find this gigantic blue and red flap hanging around, especially the noise it has to make to properly attract a, mate, attract a mate. It's very much the antithesis of natural selection. And here's a personal favorite of mine, the antichinus. <clears throat> oh, but it's dull and drab, you say! It looks like a mouse! Well, <laughs> the antichinus, when it's 11 months old, will go on a mating binge. And this is the males go on a mating binge. What happens is the hormones in their body drive them to mate and nothing else. So they will go around finding female after female and just mating with the females. And the, uh, the YouTube video puts a little music to this, but they will mate with females until their fur begins to fall out and they begin to be exa get exhausted. They will mate and search for females and if they go across a road, they may be roadkill and if they run across a predator, they will be dead. And if they run across anything that would cause them damage, they will die and they might starve to death while they're hunting for females, but all they do is mate. It's like that song, all I do is win, 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 no matter what, except all I do is mate, 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 no matter what, they mate to death. They mate themselves to death. At 11 months old, the males of this species have a death sentence where they will just mate themselves into an early grave. That's it. They mate themselves into oblivion. Why? Well, I'm going to encourage you to read other subjects or ask uh, in the forum, I may or may not answer, but it's kind of a fun reason why, actually. And there's some hypotheses as to um, why this is ad adaptive. So sexual selection does result in this kind of extremes. And one way we can know if it's sexual selection instead of natural selection is if the trait exists on only one sex. It really appears so outlandish that only the natural selection wouldn't favor this. And you can then check to see maybe it is sexual selection. It's also important to note that some sexually selected traits are lethal for old adults. So while a young adult may be able to have this trait, like the tusks of a babarusa, the older adults may not be able to have this trait and may not survive, like when the tusks of the babarusa curve upwards and occasionally penetrate the skull, killing the babarusa. It's, um, it's unfortunate, but as long as the organism has a lot of offspring, it passes its genes on to the next generation. Even if it dies a little earlier, if it had more offspring to make up for that, it's all good. So let's talk about investments. Different sexes are going to invest different things. The males are going to are going to invest sperm cells, which are basically DNA missiles with mitochondria that are going to make the flagella flap. Um, that's it. It's a very simple design cell made for uh, one thing. It's just a missile. It's a DNA missile. And of course, there are ejaculatory accessories. So in many mammals, the female's vagina is acidic, so the male will secrete, secrete things to the prostate that are going to make it a little more basic so that the sperm cells can have a longer lifespan. Simple as that. And sometimes the, uh, the male is actually going to invest a certain amount of protein into the ejaculate as well to um, feed the female in one way, shape, or form. For females, they have, to, they have to invest egg cells, which of course are already the largest cell in the body. Now, the number of egg cells depends on the female, just as the number of sperm cells depends on the male and even varies within a species greatly. So how much is being invested per ejaculate versus how much is being invested per egg? You know, it sounds like it's going to even out pretty well until you realize yolk, the yolk has to be provided, the proteins have to be provided, sometimes the shell has to be provided, sometimes milk has to be provided. So all of these things have to be provided by the female, and it ends up looking like it's more of a cost to the female. And that's going to be especially, uh, especially true in females that are going to have uh, internal 
uh, fertilization and internal um, offspring development. So the male versus the female investments are looking less and less balanced as you go on, and especially when you look at certain primates like the orangutan here, where we're dealing with a large amount of parental hair. Sorry, yeah, there you go. So parental care ends up being even more expensive. A female orangutan may be caring for her offspring for up to seven years, and during which time she has to invest resources of her own towards that offspring. Whereas the male of, males of some species just um, give the ejaculate and leave, and then they may be ready for another one within hours, um, some even minutes. So that's really not much of an investment in time for the males. And what we see already is that there is a disproportionate investment. More often than not, the female bears a higher amount of the cost. So that's going to lead to different strategies of reproduction. And we're calling that the uh, mating asymmetry. So mating asymmetry is when one sex is going to be investing a lot more than the other in uh, the production of offspring. And we can determine that experimentally, of course. <clears throat> Here we have the, uh, the log body mass in grams um, times the uh, log corrected daily gamete production rate. So how, mu how many gametes can they make? And what we see is it's more expensive for females to make gametes than it is for males to make gametes, le leading to the, uh, the saying, sperm is cheap. That's not always true. Sometimes sperm is quite expensive. Sometimes the sperm cells are actually larger than the egg cells, but that's really like invertebrates. So invertebrates, this chart is really looking mainly at vertebrates. Invertebrates have <coughs> a wider array of different mating strategies, largely because there are more invertebrates. But we're going to focus a lot more on the vertebrates in these studies here. So generally speaking, sperm is cheap. Well, what about hermaphrodites, of course? That's going to bring that up. So um, the hermaphrodites are going to have, uh, have different strategies. Sometimes hermaphrodites will want to be female. Sometimes hermaphrodites will want to be male. Well, if they want to be male more often than female, that implies that the natural selection actually favors male. So interest, or sexual selection actually favors being male because male has some sort of a less, lesser cost. And it's a really good place to study this uh, male and female traits. So what happened is they have snails and they observed if the snail is playing the male or if the snail is playing the female. So in times that the, the snail acted as a male, i.e. sperm donor, we see here the male reproductive success at zero matings is zero. Okay, duh. At one mating is about 26, and at two, at two or three matings, it went up by about 26 each time. So the male mating success is directly correlated to how many times they mate and strongly positively correlated, whereas a female mating success at zero is zero. Okay, duh. We should probably remove that data point. I don't know why it's on there. And then at one, it's about 50. At two, it's about 50. At three, it's about 50. So a very low slope. So you see the slopes of these lines, and these lines are called Bateman gradients. It's how much the fitness increases with successive matings. How much does the fitness increase with successive matings? We can look at other systems that are not hermaphrodites as well. Oh, and on the hermaphrodite side of things, there are, um, there are certain types of um, flatworms that have both, uh, the, both a penis and a vagina, cloaca. No, not so much actually. What happens is the penis actually penetrates the skin and just leaves a um, sperm under the skin and the sperm figure it out from there. So, they don't really have to, um, you know, line up right. They just have to jab with the penis, which means they actually end up fighting with the penis, which means the one that wants to be, well, it pays more to be the male than to be inseminated. So in that case, what they do is actually fence, and penis fencing is what's it called when the males actually try to inseminate the other before they get inseminated. It's a hermaphroditic system. And again, the fact that the males are, com these organisms are competing to be male in the, um, in the reproduction shows that it has a lower cost to be male, and an increased, uh, increased offspring by repeated mating as a male. Okay, let's check out some newts. All right, so newts, uh, these are rough-skinned newts, and what they, they do is they form mating balls. So the female gets to have more mates. Okay, great, but is that beneficial? Well, for males, what we see with the Bateman curve is actually very steep. The, um, the number of males that actually mated, most, uh, the, most males don't mate. 
Most males are, are getting nothing that year. They're not mating at all. Uh, the number of offspring for males that didn't mate is zero. Well, duh. But many males had 100 to 200, even 300 offspring. So does it pay to mate more? Well, yes. The more that they mate, the higher number of offspring they're going to have per male. So the Bateman curve is relatively steep. The females, on the other hand, no females didn't mate. So no females didn't mate. All females got a mate. That said, it doesn't increase their fitness much to have more mates. So the Bateman curve is relatively flat there, which means that if a female is going to mate multiple times, they're not going to get an increase in their fitness of their offspring, in their fitness. However, if a female mates with the best male, then their offspring will be better. So the females could be choosy here about which males they mate with. If, they, if it doesn't increase their fitness to have more mates, then it should increase their fitness to have better mates. Whereas for males, it doesn't matter about the quality of the mates so long as they get to mate. So that's just mating asymmetry right here, or what we actually have is it's better for males to just mate as many times as possible. And for females, Mr. Right. Just find the right one. It can flip too though. So let's look at reversals here. So what if the males are providing the care? What if the males are providing the care, says the guy who is currently at home with his kids for the 30th week of 2020. I'm going to cook them lunch after this. <laughs> so this is a story of pipefish. It's a relative of seahorses. The male's investment here includes both sperm and parental care because the female will lay the eggs on the male and the male will care for the, fem for the eggs. Female can actually gain more per partner. So what we see here is that the, uh, the number of mates for the female is actually showing a higher, a steeper slope of the Bateman curve. So the Bateman curve here has a, a rating gradient has a higher slope for the female getting more mates. It just so happens that egg development time is roughly equal to hatching time. So if the female could reduce egg development time to half of hatching time, she could mate with twice as many males, and that would be highly beneficial. So mating with more males is actually beneficial to the females, whereas mating with more males is not beneficial to the males. So when care flips, the Bateman gradients also change. So that shows that it's really about parental care that is going to lead to mating asymmetry. All right. Well, if females get to be choosy, then males should try to get chosen. So how does a male get chosen? And that is going to be something called intersexual competition. That's a, that's a D now? That's a D. Okay. Intersexual, intra... is when males are going to compete for mate, mates. Given that most males are going to have zero mates, then some males are going to have a large number of mates. They should fight to be that male that gets to have all the mates because females are going to choose their mates. So let's look at this uh, natural selection problem here in these graphs. What we see is that on um, for males and females, there are um, certain sizes, and they're measuring these with snout to vent length, which is the snout of the iguana to the vent of the iguana, which is the anus slash cloaca. So that length is going to determine basically how big is your iguana. And what we see is uh, there are a lot of big males on Santa Fe, but not a lot of really big females. Um, there are a lot on, on uh, what is it, Genovisa, there are bigger males than females. These are both islands in the Galapagos. Uh, these iguanas, they feed on marine algae, which is kind of a weird way of doing things. There's just not much vegetation for the iguanas to eat, so they feed on marine algae. Okay, cool, but they're very salty. Okay, that's going to be a metabolic cost. Okay, but they're also in very cold water. I know that the, the um, Galapagos are close to the equator, so uh, wh why is water cold? Well, it's the upwelling currents that are going to make for very cold water. Why is that a problem? Well, iguanas are cold-blooded. So they're going to be ectothermic and they're going to need to warm up themselves before they plunge into the cold water. So they have to bask in order to go into the cold water. What this also means is the bigger iguanas are going to have a metabolic cost. It takes them longer to warm up, it does take them longer to cool down, but they also have to exert more um, of their metabolism on just maintenance. And when 
And marine algae aren't exactly like the most nutritious thing. I mean, just eat nori for a week and tell me how you feel. So there's actually natural selection on the iguanas not to be big. Survival goes down for the largest iguanas. You can actually see these kind of almost bell-shaped curves. The natural selection is much harsher on Genovisa than it is on Santa Fe. And what you see is there are smaller iguanas on Genovisa than you see on Santa Fe. The females more closely match those curves, but some of these males are just too big. Why do these males grow so big <coughs> if they end up dying off because of their size and the costs that it incurs? This is one of those natural selection problems that Darwin wouldn't like. Well, it's sexual selection. Males are competing through displays, and the largest males are going to be the ones who are going to be winning these displays. They first kind of size each other up through a head bobbing, bobbing ritual, then they might butt heads, and then if that doesn't really work to figure out who's stronger, they just start biting each other and just really, you know, roughhouse, and that might be, that might be lethal or damaging. So they try to avoid that. But they, uh, they compete through these displays. So bigger males are going to get better territories. Well, what's a better territory? A better territory is where the females are basking because the females need to bask in the sun before they can go get algae. And while a female is basking, I mean, nothing like a little bit of uh, watch the surf and chill. So they watch the surf and chill, and they might get mated with. Cool. So the males are going to compete for the best places on the rocks. So where are the best places for, on the rocks? Well, you're going to find the biggest iguanas at the best places, because they're going to fight for those best places. And what we see here is that there are certain rocks on... Um, on this diagram, it shows that this shows the range of iguanas on the basking areas. And you can also see the uh, number of copulations for the iguanas. Most iguanas, um, the, the most iguanas had two or fewer copulations. So in the highest number of iguanas had zero copulations. You can see that some of these iguanas have very small territories as well. And they see iguanas 65 and 59, which just so happen to have the best possible mating places. Uh, this is the best basking rock. So 65 and 59 were the best basking rocks for females in the early morning and late afternoon when it's iguana amorous time. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, uh, iguana number 65 had 10 copulations, which was two more than the next most common ones. And that's really good. Good job, iguana 65. And then there was Chaz over here who had 45 copulations because he just had the best rocks. And he had to fight for those a lot. He fought Iguana 65 and actually lost territory to four other iguanas that managed to kind of sneak up on him. But of course, this came, come at, came at a cost. While an iguana is defending his territory, that iguana isn't feeding. And this was metabolically costly, costly for 59, uh, Chaz, um, the Chad. Yeah, the Chad, there we go. Um, because the Chad over here was also the largest iguana on the rocks. So the Chad would have been under the harshest natural selection because large iguanas, as I've shown you, have a lower survival rate. So sometimes it pays to be a small iguana because you'll survive from year to year, yay, natural selection. But being a large iguana means you get to have 45 copulations in a single season. Ugh, all hail the Chad. All right. There we go. Uh, then there are sneaky males. This is another type of strategy that males can have for male-to-male -male competition. Oh, sorry. First up uh, is yeah, combat. I'll, I'll put that a little earlier. And then there's uh, sneaky males. Sneaky males. I uh, watched the clip, and then I'm going to cover it in a minute, too. So enjoy that clip. Welcome back. All right, so <clears throat> sneaky males are kind of, it's kind of a, it's, it's not a very good way of dealing with things. It's basically forcing the, uh, the sperm on females that don't choose to copulate with you. So here we have an example of coho salmon. Coho salmon can come in two forms. There's the, um, the hook noses and the jacks. Hook noses return after 18 months at sea and are much larger. They've got these hook noses. They've got cartilaginous armor. They're not going to go back to the sea afterwards. Sometimes jacks actually would return to the sea but they try to get this early mating in about six months after they're born. So they have different strategies. The biggest, the female is going to spawn in this red here, and the uh, the male, the biggest male is going to be right behind her, and when she finishes spawning, he'll swim on over, deposit um, his gametes on top of those eggs, and then the next male gets to come along and do the same, but there's less egg, there are fewer unfertilized eggs at that point, so the first male in line gets to fertilize the most. 
There's also these um, these jacks over here which kind of circle around in little eddies and whatnot. And they behind rocks, you know, they're waiting. And they wait till she um, she actually deposits her eggs and just dive bomb uh, with sperm. Just kind of a drive-by um, insemination. So a drive-by fertilization, I guess you'd say. And that's their strategy. They don't have to fight for a mate. Uh, another example would be the blue, yellow, and red-bellied lizards. Red-bellied lizards are very aggressive lizards. Aggressive lizards. And what they'll do is they'll defend a harem of females. And as they defend that harem of females from all other lizards, they maintain a larger harem. Um, the problem is when, red lizard, when these red-bellied lizards are doing very well, blue-bellied lizards will kind of sneak in. I'm not a female. They look like females, but the females know, and they get a little uh, sneaky action on the side. So there ends up being selection for blue-bellied lizards. Okay, so blue-bellied lizards are now sneaking in and more offspring are going to have the blue alleles when the reds are dominant because the reds can't defend against the blues. Well, the blues don't defend well against the yellows. The yellow-bellied lizards are going to maintain small harems of no more than five females at a time, please. And these are actually going to be able to maintain the harem and defend them from these blue sneakers. So the yellow-bellied lizards can defend against the blue-bellied lizards because they can detect, ah, hey, hey, sneaky mail. Out of here. So they end up having a selective gradient over the blue-bellied lizards. So that's all good until a red-bellied male moves in and the red bellies are aggressive, so they scare off the yellow-bellied lizards and we're back to where we started. This kind of cyclical sneaky males, combat males, shows that there are different strategies and they're all really relevant. Sneaky males and combat males can occur in the same populations at the same time and go in cycles. Kind of cool stuff is sexual selection. What about if they've already mated? Well, it turns out there is post-mating combat, too. Uh, post-mating intrasexual selection. So there are a couple different strategies uh, here. One is uh, what's called sperm scoops. Sperm scoops are these organs that allow a male to mate with a female and to uh, first scoop out the previous male sperm, discard it, and then inseminate the female. There's also the strategy of um, you inseminate the female and then you plug it up afterwards with a kind of a concretion, which is going to prevent more males from inseminating as a plug to prevent sperm entry for another male. So that allows male to mate with a female once. After that, the female can't physically mate with any other males. Then there are anti-pheromones. And anti-pheromones are actually going to be um, added to the female during mating and prevent the female from wanting to mate again or from being attractive again. There are a whole slew of different strategies that these that, that can exist to um, to have to prevent other males uh, from mating. Then there's sperm competition, where sperm have to be faster than one another, and they just they all mate in one very short period of time, and the fastest, strongest sperm just win the race. So as you can imagine, there's also competition for access to the female at that time. It's crazy. It's mating's crazy, and that after mating can happen too. And then there's the southern right whale. It's got a very different strategy. So what it has is testicles that weigh two tons. And yes. And what they'll do is they're going to mate with a female, and their goal during mating is simply to wash out all previous sperm. So they're just the amount of ejaculate that they have is going to hopefully wash out all the other sperm. That's their strategy. Okay. So there are a lot of different strategies, even after mating, for male-to-male -male competition. Well, even after birth, there's more strategies, and that would be infanticide. So infanticide is that uh, the female has already been inseminated, impregnated, given birth, cared for it, and then the male comes along and kills it. So this would be with lions. What they'll do is they'll find another male's lion cubs, and they'll kill those other male lion cubs, which brings the female back into receptivity, and then the female will mate with them, and boom, fitness. So, a whole bunch of intrasexual competition, all to be the male. <laughs> so this shows how there is now going to be selection for these traits. Sexual selection for all these traits in order to produce more offspring. And it causes a lot of weird examples and a lot of very bizarre looking organisms. So check your objectives. What costs more, sperm or eggs? What if the sperm is very expensive and the male was taking care of the parent and doing all the parenting? What kind of mating system would you expect to see? Think back to your polygamy, polyandry, polygyandry. 
Think about that. Or uh, monogamy, too. So you think males or females would be more brightly colored if sperm were expensive? Who would be competing? This intrasexual selection, what would be competing? What kind of traits would you see? Go have some fun and make up an organism on your own if you want to, where this, uh, this opposite has occurred. And uh, that's it for this lecture. In the next one, we're going to see how, natural, how sexual selection begins to look with trade-offs, consequences, and then some good questions as to why.